about, uh, we're going through this lesson series, and Josh will come bring you on. So there's some visitors. Um, let's try to get them some. It's a very interesting time of our life. We'll probably be talking about these three weeks for the next 50 years. The doctors have said uh, a good marker is about six feet apart. So if you want a good example of that, look at the back pew over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's really good to see you guys. I'm really glad that you're with us. Uh, we're, we've been going through a lesson series called Dangerous Waves of Change in the Lord's Church. This is part three. So over the past couple of weeks, if you've not been with us, uh, we've been going pretty slowly through this outline. Uh, at first, I was kind of going to brush through these points and maybe even make it one sermon, but now each point is a sermon. <laughs> 60 or 70 years ago in this country, Go back to 1950s, 1960s. The Lord's Church was unified in all of these areas on your list. Holding to the same pattern of sound words, just going by the book, going by the Bible. And we were all, as, as the Lord's Church, I was, I was around, but the Lord's Church was speaking the same thing. No divisions among us, uh, perfectly joined together, the same mind and the same doctrine, First uh, Corinthians 1.10. As we stated several times up here, um, we're not talking about the denominations in this lesson series. There's a lot of different things we could say about the churches out there, but we're talking about congregations of the churches of Christ. Those who will put Church of Christ on their sign and some of the changes that are being made. Many are no longer teaching on some of these issues that you hold in your hand. And if they are, they're not holding to sound doctrine with regard to these things. So certain Christians have drifted away. And we've got to be careful we're not part of that group. Drifted away from the biblical pattern over the years. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, the church was told even in the first century, it says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Why? Lest we drift away. So that is, hold on to these things that you've heard from God's word for, for a very long time. Hold on to them, grab on, as to not let go, the Hebrew writer says. Because there's a very strong possibility you could drift away from it. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 in the Old Testament. When the children of Israel had drifted away from God's way for them, the prophet wrote, Thus, say, thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old path where the way is good, and walk in it, then you will find rest for your soul. But they said, we will not walk in it. Today, many Christians are, are drifting from the old path under the Christian dispensation, and saying, we will not walk in it. God's way is old-fashioned for us. Uh, we, we want to make some changes to suit our needs. We want to make some changes to suit the culture. So this morning, uh, I want to cover another item of false teaching or the, uh, the, you know, that falls into this category of drifting away from the old pattern uh, and of Scripture. So we've been going over category number one on your list, which is the category changes in doctrine. And uh, under that category, we've been discussing four moral issues that are not being properly addressed in the churches of Christ, not being preached soundly anymore. And so this morning, we're going to cover the item, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And that's what we're going to discuss for this lesson. Now, if you were not here for the first two of, of these, with the dancing lesson and the immodest apparel lesson, uh, you can come talk to me. I can maybe get you a copy of that or point you to our website. Uh, and I'd like to get... Get all of these lessons passing around. But marriage, divorce, or remarriage is what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, you know, it, it, it might seem like we talk about this topic an awful lot, especially if you are part of the Davison congregation. Uh, we talk about that a lot, Travis. But the verse we just read, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. You know, if we don't continue, drill these topics into our heads from the pulpit and discuss them in the classroom 
and we don't continually do this, you know, the, then the waves of change that we're talking about won't be so easy to notice when they come. We've got to bring a remembrance and a reminder of these things constantly. So, you know, I, I hope that each one of us will learn God's law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage so well that no one will be able to pull a fast one on you when it comes to this topic. As to leave you stumped. Oh, I don't really know the answer to that question. I hope you will always be ready to give an answer. As 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 said. As with many of the items on your list, I believe the truth on marriage, divorce, and remarriage has been very watered down in the Church of Christ because so many Christians face this situation in their own lives. I think that's the point. It's like the topic of dancing. Many elders and preachers won't preach against it anymore the way they would back in the 50s in this country because they have family members who, or friends who let their children go to prom or dance at weddings and things of that nature. With, with the topic of immodest apparel, many won't preach against it because they have family members or friends who they know dress immodestly and they don't want to step on toes or point these things out. It's the same with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. You know, it's not that the teaching is hard to understand of marriage, divorce, or remarriage. But many people simply teach something different. Why? Well, the same reason. Because many friends and close family members to them in the congregation are perhaps in an unscriptural marriage. Amen. So the point is, God's law does not change even if it hits close to home. And in fact, I'd say that's especially when God's law needs to apply, is when it hits close to home. Because, you know, we don't want any of our friends, any of our loved ones to miss out on heaven because we didn't teach them the truth. Why do people want to change the truth and, and make it suit their needs? The first part of this lesson, I'm going to keep very brief. Uh, God's law on marriage is simple, and it can be summed up in two very simple points. Number one, the Bible says marriage is for life. One man, one woman, tell the Bible describes it, for life. Number two, there's only one exception to that law, in which God accepts divorce so that remarriage can take place. That's it. If the church could learn these two points, again, and how simple yet strict they are, it wouldn't be so, we wouldn't be in so much trouble. We need to learn these points again and keep learning them. So number one, let's just see how plainly this is. The Bible says marriage is for life. For the most part, that's the point. That's God's law on marriage. You could wrap it up if we could leave it there. That'd be nice to leave it there. Just stay married for life. Matthew 19, verse 6. Jesus taught regarding this topic. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Before Jesus gives the one exception in verse 19 of this chapter, Jesus' first answer when asked about this topic, it was essentially this. Husbands, wives, do not separate from one another. Man, that's God's law. That's God's law on marriage. That's what he expects out of us. Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. God hates when two people who have entered into a covenant of marriage together don't keep it until death. Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3 says, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband. How long? As long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. And that goes for the man and the woman. Uh, sometimes it plugs it in with the, with the husband. Sometimes it plugs it in with the wife. So the general rule is the marriage covenant stays intact as long as both parties are still alive. That's the point. God bound them together for life. So when one of them dies, the Bible says the covenant <coughs> dies with it. Once the spouse dies, there's no more marriage covenant. So that, the living spouse, is then free to go out and make another covenant to remarry. 
Then I think we could tie in the tail end of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32 here. It adds... Actually, hold on, I'm not there yet. We're here. If a woman divorces her husband while he's still alive, and then she goes out and marries another, she will be called what? An adulteress. That's pretty plain. That's pretty simple. While he's alive. Okay, so now Matthew chapter 5, verse 32 adds this. It says, whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now that one's interesting. Let's say that this is a single guy off the street. He's never been married before. And he comes and marries this woman who has been divorced. The Bible says he commits adultery too. Someone says, well, I didn't know that a person who is single could commit adultery. Well, why is it adultery? The Bible says it's because her original marriage covenant is still intact with her living husband. That's the point. Anytime sexual relations occur involving a married person with a third party, the Bible says, first off, he commits adultery and she commits adultery. Both of them are committing adultery. So this <laughs> law between the husband and the wife is in effect how long? As long as they both remain alive together at the same time. One of them dies, it frees them. Point number two, there's one exception to this law. Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus said, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. So here is, we see one exception for how a man can divorce his wife and marry another without committing adultery. What is that exception? The word is fornication. If a spouse commits fornication, the innocent party in the marriage may divorce the guilty party, because they broke the contract, so to speak. Fornication is defined, and that is the Greek word pornea, it's where we get our word pornography, porn, is defined as this. Any unlawful sexual intercourse, now that's the point, sexual intercourse, as intercourse between two people who are not married to each other, or have no right to be together, that's fornication, unlawful sexual intercourse. So the Bible says this to husbands and wives. If your spouse commits sexual intercourse with someone else, that is the actual act of intercourse, you have the option of putting that unfaithful spouse away and marrying someone else. Matthew chapter 5 verse 32 says the same thing. And one thing I also want to point out is to mention uh, the, the response of Jesus' disciples when they heard the strictness of God's law on this topic. You remember what they said? Matthew chapter 19, verse 10 says, His disciples said to him, If such is the case with a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. What was their conclusion on the matter? Because I think it's interesting. Essentially, if, if this law is so strict, you know, we say that it's better not to marry at all. Not to even enter into the covenant. You should just remain unmarried rather than worrying about trying to keep the strictness of this law. Jesus' response to them was, well, not everyone can accept that sin. That is, not everyone can make the decision to never marry, never have sexual relations. That's a very hard thing to do. Not everyone can do that, he said. And he said, well, you know, there are eunuchs who have made that decision for various reasons, right? They've chosen not to be married, not to have sexual relations for different reasons, but not everybody can make that decision. For those who decide to marry, understand this right now. God's law on marriage is very strict. Now, I think that's the point. That's one of the main points here. You know, people get so upset at us, and we tell them about the strictness of God's law on marriage and the implications of it. And they get mad at us for preaching it. But who made the law on marriage strict? Right? God the Father did. And Jesus here is, was relaying the information from the Father. Jesus' apostles responded, wow, that's a strict law. And the Bible says this law is very strict. And that's why so many are tempted to, to be swayed and bend it. 
so that it applies differently to their lives and why they're doing that. So next, here's what we want to do in this lesson. Let's see how you're doing on understanding this law. Let me give you a scenario. Now this scenario I want you to keep in mind for the rest of this lesson. We're going to talk about it and keep referring back to it. So we're going to talk about Alex and Brittany. They're married to each other. And they have started getting very frustrated in their marriage. Alex has not been pulling his weight around the house. Brittany thinks he's a slob. And she can't put up with him anymore. So what happens in today's day and age? She decides to divorce him. Not putting up with it, she says. Done. Two years later, Brittany meets Sam. A single guy who has never been married before. And they hit it off great. You know, Sam is so happy to meet, quote unquote, the love of his life. And before long, Sam and Brittany, of course, get married in the eyes of the state. Here's the question. Did Sam and Brittany have the right, in God's eyes, to get married? Yes or no? Is this a sanctioned marriage? No, it is not. Why not? Because in God's eyes, Brittany's covenant to Alex is still intact. Right? That lifelong promise, the covenant that Alex and Brittany made together, is still there. Right? It's still in effect. God has bound them together for life. What was the marriage vow? I'm going to be faithful until death to you. Romans chapter 7, verse 3, as we read, it says, So then, if while her husband lives, that's Alex, she marries another man, that's Sam, she will be called what? An adulteress. Matthew 19, verse 9, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever divorces, except for fornication. Now let me ask you, was this for fornication? No. Whoever divorces and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever, listen, whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So what we have here is not only is Brittany an adulteress, but Sam is an adulterer. That's what we have to get and teach. The Bible teaches that this relationship between Brittany and Sam is not sanctioned in the eyes of God. But it is an adulterous marriage. You know, how many marriages like this do we see today? And I just take a break here and say, I'm, I'm sad over this. This is a sad scenario. No one's taught it. I don't care what denomination people go to. It's not taught anywhere. And people don't know about it. And so this happens all the time. Oh, yeah, I'm tired of Alex. I'm going to go marry Sam, right? They don't understand. That's not okay. That's not okay in God's eyes. We see thousands <laughs> of these relationships today. And we must add that just because the United States government will grant the marriage status on these two, that doesn't even mean, I mean, God doesn't even see them as married. That's what the Bible says. God sees them as committing adultery while Alex is still alive. You know, so here's the question that will help you sort through any marriage, divorce, remarriage situation. Ask yourself this question. What was the reason for the divorce? That's the question you've got to ask yourself. Why, why did, divorce, did divorce happen? What was the reason? And in this scenario, why did Brittany decide to divorce Alex? Well, we've already established it because he was a slob. She got rid of him for that reason. And you know, does that match up with the reason of fornication? Did Alex cheat on her so that she put him away for unfaithfulness? No, he did not. No, she could not. So, you know, it wouldn't matter if she divorced him because he was a drunk. That's a sad situation. Many people do become drunks and it becomes abusive of a, of a situation. It wouldn't matter if she divorced him because he was addicted to pornography and was unfaithful in that sin. Or because they just fell out of love. Any of these things, none of these reasons match the one exception, fornication, which allows the putting away and remarriage. So the only reason that one may divorce their spouse and be granted remarriage is for sexual unfaithfulness. That's it. That's the only reason given in the New Testament. Now let me show you why God's people find this law so hard to stand for. Let me give you a, an illustration. 
Travis is the preacher at the Davidson Church of Christ. He meets a really nice guy. And they become good friends. His name is Sam. Sam shows some interest in the Bible. So Travis sets up a weekly Bible study with Sam, who says, my wife, Brittany, would like to take part in these lessons too. And Travis says, great, I'm excited for this. This is such a happy, I'm so glad. This is a young couple, by the way. Let's say they're in their 30s. At this point, Sam and Brittany have already had two kids. And they say, we're excited to study with you. You know, We've been looking for a church to raise our kids. We're so excited. You guys are so friendly. This is great. So Travis begins to teach them about the Bible. Shows them the truth about the Godhead, God's authority, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they're so hungry for these truths. They're eating this up, and they're accepting what the Bible says, and they love it. But the moment comes when they must talk about repentance of sins and obedience to God. They must turn from all sin in order to have their sins forgiven. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Acts 17, verse 30. So they get to studying about sin so that it can be made clear. They get to the topic of adultery and God's law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And in the midst of this discussion, Brittany brings up her first marriage to Alex. And how Alex is still alive and well. And that the reason that she divorced Alex in the first place was because he was a slob. Brittany and Sam both see the implications of these scriptures. And they see it. They understand. And they ask, does this mean that we have to break our marriage if we want to go to heaven? Is that what repentance implies? And they put this spotlight back on the Christian. One of the hardest answers that any Christian must tell someone while they're presenting them the gospel is the words of John the Baptist that he said to Herod in Matthew chapter 14 verse 4. It is not lawful for you to have. Hardest word that will ever have to come out of your mouth. The implication is you must separate. This marriage in God's eyes, is not a marriage. It is not sanctioned in God's eyes, but you are living in adultery. And as emotional as this type of situation is, we have got to tell people the truth. We can't butter this down or sugarcoat it. There's no way to do it. Because if God is judging them by this standard, by the way, why would you not tell them if you care about their soul's truth? Why would you not tell them? I mean, you know, and, and even in this situation with Sam and Brittany, even if time goes by, even when kids come along and they grow up, if the original spouse is still alive, God still binds the first covenant, unless fornication was the reason for the divorce. In the first Lastly, for our lesson, do you see why this is such a tough doctrine to teach among our friends and our neighbors when we're presenting them? The gospel. It makes it hard, right? And can you see why many preachers and elders are letting things slide? <coughs> They'll let things slide in their congregations. They draw up changes to God's doctrine to make things easier. Sure, you can come and be, be in this congregation. We'll let it be. And we won't say nothing about it. For the remainder of this lesson, I want to discuss some answers that some preachers would give in this situation. And they are giving to individuals like Brittany and Sam. You see, the truth is, we've talked about Sam and Brittany are living in adultery. There's no way around it. Okay? It is constant sin as long as they're together in this. And as happy as they might be with one another, and as much as we would love to grant them the okay, the truth is, it's not our fault. Hide behind the Bible on this one. Say, I'm sorry, I can't change it. Because when they get... Before God's judgment seat, he's going to judge them according to his law that we've been talking about. And God's going to tell them that the first marriage covenant was bound for life. That's what you entered in, that marriage. And you two are now committing adultery. 
So let's study together uh, answers given by preachers out there so that those in adulterous marriages would not have to separate. Here's some answers that they'll say, yeah, Sam and Brittany, here's why you, you don't have to separate. And maybe you've heard some of these. I'll call these quick fixes that, that man has concocted. You find them nowhere in the Word of God. Error number one. Maybe you've heard this one. Don't worry about your marriage situation. Here's why. Baptism washes away sinful marriage. Have you heard that one? After baptism, it is cleansed. It was a sinful marriage. Now it is a lawful marriage in God's eyes. This has become a, a, a very common answer among people today. But the problem with this one, we really could narrow it down to one word, repentance. Amen. All right, let me just ask you, what other sinful situation is allowed to continue after baptism? Ask him that question. Think about it. You know, if someone was a drunk before they became a Christian, once they're baptized, does that action of drunkenness suddenly become cleansed, so to speak, and no longer is sinful? Right? You say, well, no. It's still sinful after baptism. If someone viewed pornography before they became a Christian, once they're baptized, does that mean that the viewing of pornography is suddenly cleansed in God's eyes and they can continue it? Right, we understand that what is sin before baptism remains sin after baptism, and it cannot continue. That's repentance in a nutshell. So if someone was living in an adulterous marriage before their baptism, does it make any sense whatsoever that it would not continue to be an adulterous marriage after their baptism? It doesn't make any sense. You know, to make this even clearer, let's pretend that before someone became a Christian, they were in a homosexual marriage granted by the state. Two men living together and having sexual relations. And I ask this to members of the Church of Christ. Does the Bible teach that baptism, you know, that that's, that after baptism, that that sinful relationship is suddenly sanctioned in God's eyes? All right, the problem with this one is the necessity of repentance. It's very clear. If it is an unlawful relationship before baptism, it is most certainly going to remain an unlawful relationship after baptism, and it cannot continue. Same thing with any other sin. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, there has been no repentance. Error number two. Some people try to answer it this way. They'll say, well, you don't have to separate, because here's why. Non-Christians are not accountable to Christ's law. Only Christians. And they'll say, you know, once, once you have become a Christian, that's when you enter into the covenant agreement, which includes God's law on marriage. So, you know, before that, before you became a Christian, Christ's law on marriage didn't apply to you. So, it, 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 it doesn't, you, you aren't accountable to that. So, essentially, even if you had been divorced and remarried seven times before your baptism, it really wouldn't matter. Right? It's, it's only once you enter the covenant relationship with God at baptism that God's law on marriage applies to you. And, you know, this one is an absolutely ridiculous position to hold. The Bible teaches that the law of Christ applies to everyone, right, not just Christians. You know, in John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So here's my question. On the last day, when Christ is judging according to his word, is he going to be judging only Christians according to his word? Or is he going to be judging all according to his word? All men. Right? In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now listen to verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord... We persuade men. Well, why do you persuade men, Paul? What's the point? Why do you try to convince people about this? Because everyone is going to stand before Christ. Everyone. And be judged according to his law. You know, Paul said to a group of non-Christians in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, he says, Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now command, listen, all men, everywhere, to repent. 
Christ's law applies to everyone. And we're all, everybody's going to be judged by it. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11? Paul mentions to Christians a list of sins that will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And listen to what he says. He says, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor any of these other sins will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. And Christians, such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Right. So he's saying, Christians, some of you were, don't miss it, adulterers. Before your baptism. Well, you might ask the question, well, how could they be called adulterers before they became Christian? If God's law doesn't apply to everybody. The point is, God's law applies to everybody. They were adulterers before their baptism. That's how you would answer that. Error number three. Some people tell those in, a, in an adulterous marriage, well, I would not tell you to, to separate. Here's why. The Bible says, God hates divorce. So God will want you to stay together. I heard you know, one preacher tell his whole congregation essentially this. All we need to do, Christian, is just stop breaking marriages. That was his law on marriage. And, and it sounds right, but here's, here's what he was getting at. Is basically, whether you're in your first marriage or your fourth <coughs> marriage, just stop breaking marriages. That's, that was, it. That's what was how he preached God's law on marriage, for your marriage. Because God hates it when you break a marriage. God hates it. But you know, that's not right. That is not the right way to answer this. If you are in a marriage that is unlawful in God's eyes in the first place, not only is it all right in God's eyes that you separate with that person, but it is required that you separate. We talked about repentance. God, think about it, God doesn't even view you as married. In the Old Testament, we see this principle applied to Israel uh, when they had unlawful marriages in God's sight. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, shows us that God did not permit marriages to the heathen nations. Right? Jews had to marry Jews. And so this is not our law today, but this was among the Israelites. He said, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son nor their daughter to your son. So they couldn't marry outside the Jewish family, I guess you could say. But some of the children of Israel, well, they did ignore God's law for them on marriage, and they did it anyway. And they married wives and took husbands of the heathen nations. Well, if you jump over to Ezra, chapter 10, and verse 10, listen to a circumstance where Israel was called to repent, and Israel wanted to repent. It was a time of reform. And listen to what the God of heaven, who, by the way, hates divorce, listen to what he required of them. Verse 10 says, Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed, and here's what you've done. You've taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your father, and do his will. What do you got to do? Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the pagan ones. So Israel had taken wives that were unlawful to have. And as a nation, they were commanded. They were commanded to separate themselves from these unlawful marriages. And do not miss verse 44. After all these names were listed about those who had separated themselves from their pagan wives. Verse 44 says, after that long list of names, says, all these men and women had taken, or all these men had taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Even though children were involved in these marriages, God required separation of a husband and a wife who were unlawfully married. It didn't change. Which brings us to error number four. Some people say, if children are involved, God will want you to stay together for the sake of the children. Now, I can understand what the, the, the heartstring tug on this one. I hate this situation. But even in this circumstance, 
It does not magically turn a sinful relation into a non-sinful one. Right? As emotional as this situation might be, adultery is adultery even when kids enter the picture. Error number five. Some people will answer it this way and tie this in. Well, fornication afterward, after the divorce, will allow for remarriage. Now, here's how this one goes. Let's say that in the case of Alex and Brittany, after Brittany had divorced Alex because he was a slob, one year later, let's say Alex has fornication with another woman, committing adultery. And by the way, that's what Matthew chapter 5, verse 32 says, isn't it? When one divorces their spouse, they cause them to commit adultery because they didn't keep their, their covenant. They're, if she's going to cause him to get, get the urge to be unfaithful, if he puts her away, the same thing for her, him, her. So some people would teach that Brittany now, after the fact, has the right to remarry because of the fornication that took place after the divorce. I want you to think about this. Let me explain to you why fornication after the divorce, the divorce will not free Brittany to remarry. Because Matthew chapter 19, verse 9 says, Jesus says, whoever divorces except for fornication, and marries another. Sorry, that's the wrong one. And marries another, commits adultery. All right, so the, you think of, the, the answer lies in the question, what was the reason for the divorce? That's what we're getting at. And if you've already divorced them for some other reason, you can't all of a sudden go back and say, now I'm going to divorce you again. I'm going to divorce you this time for fornication. You've already divorced. What was the reason? You know, so if you can't answer the reason for my divorce was fornication, then you cannot remarry. God does not grant remarriage. So in this scenario, Brittany did not divorce Alex for fornication. She divorced him because he was a slob. Then afterwards, after the fact, he went out, committed adultery. And it stays there. So always ask yourself what was the reason for the divorce. Error number six, and lastly, some people push this argument to allow for remarriage, maybe you've heard this one. Pornography is fornication. If Alex was addicted to pornography, lusting and doing things, of course, that he should not have, and if that was the reason why Brittany divorced her husband in the first place, some teach that Brittany would then be free to remarriage because Matthew chapter 5, verse 28 says lust is equivalent to adultery. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says, But I say to you that whoever, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the Bible says if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. So essentially what Jesus is saying with this one is if you look with lust and, and a lustful desire in your heart, it's just as bad, just as condemning to your soul as if the deed actually took place. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, I don't wish to belittle uh, the terrible evils of pornography or a disgusting lust of that nature. But the word fornication in Matthew 19, verse 9, cannot equate to lust of the heart. Okay? If you look at the definition of fornication again, that Greek word pornea, it is defined as any unlawful sexual intercourse. Okay, it is the, what we're talking about is the actual act of intercourse between two people who have no right to be together. So inherently, this word for fornication involves two individuals. And it involves the actual act of intercourse taking place. So as sinful and as harmful as, as pornography is in a marriage, and it, it is sin before God, it does not meet the exception in Matthew 19.9, which would allow them to divorce and remarry. So pornography is not fornication. So there's definitely more that we could cover, more uh, errors that we could talk about. We'll leave it at that. Thank you for your attention on this subject. Um, it's my hope that we can always be ready to show people God's law on marriage, divorce, or marriage. And may we always resist these waves of change that are sweeping into the Lord's church, especially with regards to this topic. Because it can 
and any sin in the church can permeate throughout the whole body. So if you're not a Christian this morning, the Bible says you just have to become a Christian and remain faithful to death. How you do that, you have to hear the message of the gospel, believe it, repent of your sins, confess Christ before men, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. The Lord will add you to his church. You rise up a new creature ready to remain faithful unto death. So if anyone would like to do that today, or if any Christians uh, need to repent of sins in public nature or need prayers, please come while we stand and sing. The world all alone.